So tonight I will take you to a walk on the beach of the Dirac Sea. Now, as, as I mentioned before real quick, and now of course I forgot to turn it on, um, there are, in physics, we have two fundamental theories that are exceptionally successful. So on one side, we have quantum mechanics and the standard model of particle physics that describes all the matter. And on the other side, we have gravity that describes black holes, gravitational waves, and both are super successful, but in between is the value of failed theories. Now, whenever one attempts a new journey to bridge the gap between these two theories, then there are a lot of skeptics. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, so that, that, that's what happens most often. <laughs> All right. OK. Um, so when, whenever there, there are a lot of skeptics, and of course, the question is, when you write down a new model, the, is this now the journey to the promised land or just another attempt that will end up in the valley of failed theories? <laughs> now, the theory that, or the framework that I will introduce you tonight is called causal Fermion systems. Now, except the last words, you probably don't know what, that, what any of this means. So I will spend most of the time trying to explain you the actual words that make up the theory. Now, for fermions, I have to start a little earlier with our friend Schrodinger. One day in 1925, he wanted to buy a cat, but he wasn't sure whether it was dead or alive. So he came up with quantum mechanics to calculate the probability. That's not really what happened, but anyway. Um, short after, um, Pauli, he really liked electrons, so that's like the brother of the proton. Um, and so he modified Schrodinger's theory to encompass for what is known as the spin of the electron. So he could describe that and they were happy until a wild Einstein appeared. <laughs> and Einstein was like, you know, there is this universal speed limit and your theory just doesn't obey it. So then along came Dirac and he wrote down an equation that satisfied, that, that could derive Pauli's equation and Schrodinger's and that also satisfied the speed limit. But now this new theory had another problem. It doesn't have a ground state. Now, you might ask, what is a ground state? Why does it matter? Now, when I have this ball here, and it's in my hand or on the ground, classically, that's not a problem. But as soon as quantum mechanics comes into the play, you can think of quantum mechanics as like everything is shaking. So basically, when I do that, eventually it will fall down, right? And so now the difference is when I shake this building, it won't go further down. So the ground state is kind of like the lowest state where the ball can go to. Now, his theory, you can imagine as like an infinite staircase. So there's nowhere where the ball will stop falling down. Now, the good, theor the good physicist, as Derek was, he was like, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And he just introduced a randomly assigned step zero and said, well, up to here, my staircase is flooded with water. So now when I put the ball further down, it wants to swim. And if I, if I drop it down, it can't go below the surface. Now, this is essentially what is known as the Dirac Sea. And the thing is, below the surface, if you pick up a state, then that behaves equal and opposite to when you're above the sea level. And that's basically how Dirac predicted the existence of antimatter. Now, that almost solved everything, but again came Einstein, and now with his general theory of relativity. So here you have on the left-hand side of the equation, you have curvature of space-time, and on the right-hand side, the energy density of matter. Now, so matter tells space-time how to curve, and the, curve ta the curvature of space-time tells matter how to move. Now, with the Dirac sea, it has an infinite energy density, so essentially it makes the space-time collapse in on itself. So eventually people came up with various approaches to fix that problem, um, but here comes in the new idea by Felix Finster, is to assign to the Dirac sea a completely new meaning. So instead of just arguing it away, you take it completely serious. And now you think of the Dirac sea as kind of like the stage on which the world plays. So, and this is the point essentially where causality comes into play. 
So when, I, when I'm back home in Switzerland, and I want to go visit a friend, this geographic map doesn't really help me too much. What I want to know is how long does it take me to get from one corner to the others? And here you can see now the time travel distance maps for Switzerland. So like, this is like a distorted version that tells you how long it takes to go from A to B. And this is essentially what the causal Fermi system then gives you. It's like, it's like this distorted map on top of the Dirac sea. So you can think of the space time, it's kind of like gives you then the relationship between the two points. Now, um, so in this picture, the Dirac sea kind of acts as like this common uh, thing. And so uh, as an example for when you think of electromagnetic fields, so like the radiation that you use when you use Wi-Fi and everything, um, this is the analogy that I used to explain this. So when I take you for a walk on the beach and I'm interested in the shape of your feet, don't ask why, physicists, theoretical mathematicians, we're sometimes weird, um, then it is the same whether I look at the shape of your foot or whether I look at the, so I get the same information from your foot directly or from the collective behavior of the sand grains. So this is essentially what you can think of, like the electromagnetic fields are then kind of like given as like the collective behavior of the Dirac sea. And to end my talk here, I want to show you an early proponent of this new theory. As you can see, he's walking on the Dirac sea there and it's a little curvy. Thank you.